cloudy and 36. In Johnson City, it's cloudy and 36. Colin Cowherd. Colin, you got to give Jacksonville credit. Hey, I'm not MasterCard. None, zero. I don't give Atlanta credit. Guarantees don't mean anything, and either the cool nicknames for your offense or defense. You talked it, you brought it, but like all cocky guys, they get tight late. New England doesn't flaunt it, doesn't talk it. This is The Herd with Colin Cowher. Two through five on 1420 NBC Sports Radio Tri-City. Follow us on Facebook. Peyton Manning to Monday Night Football? And the end of an era. This is Media Watch. All right. Where to begin? The end of an era, I guess, is one that I would like to uh, begin with today. Uh, and yeah, the Manning to Monday Night Football rumors are heating up, but I'll get to that here in a little bit. Uh, and just in a few minutes, actually. But yeah, end of an era. I wanted to mention this. Uh, I miss in the morning. Legendary radio program goes back to the 70s. Uh, I'm a big fan of Don IMS, those radio wars with him and Howard Stern. Uh, big, I've listened to IMS a lot uh, over the years. I mean, he's somebody that I probably take a lot from. And I also, I, I respect kind of the uh, sports themes that he has had and his influence on sports talk radio. I'm going to get to that here in just a second. But I Miss in the Morning is going to be going off the air uh, following their broadcast on March 29th, 2018. Now, a lot of people will say, hey, didn't they go off the air 10 years ago when I Miss uh, made some ill-fated statements about the Rutgers basketball team, women's basketball team, after they lost the national championship final to the Tennessee Volunteers. Lady Vols, actually, I guess. And you've got a point there. He was suspended, fired, he reemerged on RFD, then on uh, Fox Business for a while. He used to be on MSNBC before MSNBC was you know, the absolute left-wing network, you know, before they had established themselves as that. Uh, he has been on WABC since then, and I think that's all that he's bringing broadcast on right now. I got to be honest with you, his show is a shadow of what it used to be. An absolute shadow. It's having his wife come on as a frequent guest and, you know, just ranting and raving about environmental causes and things of this nature and holistic healing, which is fine. I mean, if that's what you're into, but uh, it just is not the show that it once was in which Joe Biden once announced that he was running for president on. He made his announcement on Imus in the morning. I would point this out on the influence that Imus in the Morning had on Sports Talk Radio. Uh, sports Talk has been with us before the advent, of course, of the 24-7 Sports Talk station, which, of course, 1420 NBC Sports Radio Tri-Cities is. Uh, you had usually, uh, although around here it didn't really tick off until about 1970, or excuse me, 1990, but uh, you had a circumstance where the the sports talk show host, and then you know usually on the news talk radio station in a major market, that was what took over at six p.m. for in a, in a previous generation. And the guy who had that forum, that really was for a period of time the public forum in a pre-internet age. You know, calling up, giving your take having maybe it screened by a producer or something like that, but uh, the influence of the early hosts that they had back in the day was really something special. Uh, I do believe, and I mean, you, you probably heard LeBron James scores his 3,000th point uh, yesterday, seventh player in NBA history to do so. The Cleveland Cavaliers would not be in Cleveland if it were not for a sports talk host at the time and the pioneer of our genre named Pete Franklin. He His show probably kept the Cavaliers in town 
for a long, long time and really prevented Ted Sepian, who was the owner of the Cavaliers at the time, from being the incompetent owner who just closes up shop and takes his team to another market. His criticism and his 50,000 watt signal that could be heard throughout half the country was very instrumental at the time in saying, wait a minute, this is not our city's fault. We supported this team when they were good, and they weren't good for that long, but, you know, we're worthy of having a basketball team. It's the owner. Look what he is doing. And, in fact, another thing that that uh, took place about was, if I can elaborate on this, uh, Franklin was so critical of Ted Stepien, called him T.S., too stupid, that he was actually sued for defamation. Lawsuit didn't hold up, and that's big, because that means that basically I can come on here and I can say what I want to uh, in terms of sports without reprisal. If I pick the home team to lose and all that, uh, I don't get sued. I mean, you know, and I mean, it's a, it seems unlikely that one would, but keep in mind the influence that that had at the time and that you could, you know, you didn't have to be when somebody was totally incompetent, just say something nice, making sure that no one is hurt and all that when he was a detriment to the franchise and really to the city itself, because he probably was going to take the team away from it. And that's something I've always believed in. And that's something I've always subscribed to in my career. All right. That's Franklin. Franklin actually went to WFAN when WFAN became the first all-sports radio station in the market. He was supposed to be the big gun because, like I said, he was the pioneer of sports talk radio. However, and it's pretty well established, uh, although he did have a national following, uh, his shtick just didn't play well in New York. He was looked at as an outsider and... What had occurred is that WFAN was really kind of struggling. What would we do with the morning? And you have to understand, now this is 30 years ago. The idea of a sports talk show in the morning, even on a 24-7 sports radio station, well, really it was kind of a 27 sports radio station because that wasn't fully embraced. Even ESPN, they didn't show Sports Center in the mornings back then. They showed Nation's Business Today. ESPN. That's the, that's the beginning of ESPN. They did it until 1991. The concept of a morning sports talk radio station. And when you think about it, why? I, I mean, it's absurd that you wouldn't have one. Because what do we talk about on even general, on music morning radio stations? Hey, how'd the home team do last night? Here's the scores from last night. And usually the host, you'll go in with the sports guy, rib him a little bit, got a little bit of give and take. That's a huge part of morning radio, always has been. So why that wouldn't relate to the morning, maybe the feeling was, oh, you can't get callers in that time of day. Maybe the feeling was you couldn't get guests. So it turned out you could do both. After all, I mean, I missed in the morning. I was getting political leaders on in the morning. And see, I miss was very big because having him on in the morning on WFAN really did help sell the rest of the day. It gave credibility to the station. It gave somebody that New Yorkers are familiar to listen to on a radio frequency, 660 FM, or excuse me, 660 AM, that they already were used to listening to him, and for that matter, for a period of time, Howard Stern, uh, on, because that was the frequency of the old WNBC, and it allowed there to be a lot of revenue that came into WFAN. Now, you just heard on our previous break, and we're looking for salespeople, okay? 
and Maria True, who is watching right now on Facebook, hello Maria, uh, talks about how these formats are so successful. I want to tell you, the news, 24-7 news station, the number one billing station in the country right now is WTOP. The number four, I believe, is, and forgive me if I'm wrong on some of these figures, but they are very highly ranked billing stations. I believe the number four, is it number four or number 10? Used to be number one. Is WFAN, the all-sports station in New York. So these are two top 10, I can safely say that. Uh, billing formats. You're dealing with professional people, smart people, people who have wealth. You're dealing with mature people. You're dealing with, you know, in the terms of sports, a male demographic. So it's very easy to target. And this is what, because of Imus and his credibility, the rest of the format was allowed to succeed. Imus in the morning going off the air on March 29th after that show. I mean, Sports Talk Radio has a lot of gratitude. We may not have... 24-7, because WFAN, that was the test case. That was the pilot program. And, you know, eventually, as I said, Pete Franklin didn't make it, and uh, the programmers realized, you know what, we need people that know the market where you're doing sports talk radio. And I still think that, that there's something to be said for that. Uh, even if you're coming in from out of town to uh, be part of the market, uh, then you better embrace it, or else people are not going to embrace you. It's just the way that I look at that. Uh, I wanted to get to this interesting tidbit. We've talked about this. Who's going to replace John Gruden in Monday Night Football booth? I don't think it's that difficult, to tell you the truth. I really don't. Uh, John Gruden was never Howard Cosell. John Gruden, you know, he really, you know, I start thinking John Gruden was never Frank Gifford. I don't think John Gruden's legacy on Monday Night Football matches up to those guys or Al Michaels. I, I don't think so at all. In fact, and I realize one's on NBC and the other's on ESPN, so there's more exposure being on NBC, but I think Sunday Night Football has replaced Monday Night Football as that national must-watch game. In fact, I think Monday Night Football is quite irrelevant. What to get back to Monday Night Football? Fred Hank Williams, the junior, the other, you know, this year? Okay. How about Peyton Manning? ESPN will talk to Peyton Manning about the open Monday Night Football gig. That would be huge. Network executive Stephanie Drewley told Sports Illustrated Peyton Manning is one of the people ESPN will talk to about taking the job of analyst on Monday Night Football. Now, the Pro Bowl will be Announced by color commentator joining Sean McDonough, Dunna, excuse me, Matt Hasselbeck, the former Seahawks quarterback. Obviously, his wife, well known, you know, on the View. But you know, is all the family outspoken? I guess we'll find out here soon. I'm sorry, I can't take the call from Lumen Serve right now. Drewley said they like Peyton Manning, and it'd be foolish not to talk to him. Who doesn't like Peyton Manning? Only the teams that he's vanquished. Former Cowboys quarterback Tony Romo was a hit in the booth for CBS. Absolutely. So it's no surprise ESPN would see if they could land Manning, who has been the number one pitchman in America for how long? Drewley once says that the target date to hire a new color commentator is the spring. They want someone who loves the game. Obvious. No, they're going to have somebody who's indifferent about football call the game. Sure. But a student of the game and a personality that's manning, we want them to have interests outside of football and the ability to connect with the viewers. We talk often about how a broadcast should personalize and analyze. Uh, they are also considering Hasselbeck the thing about Manning is if he would feel it's too small for him. That's a lot of preparation. 
And it's ESPN. It's not network. I do believe that we are in the final days of Monday Night Football. I've said this. Uh, I, the only way I could see Monday Night Football surviving, because I do not think that ESPN is going to pick up the $1.9 billion package to keep it after 2021. I know I'm repeating myself here, but what I think is going to happen instead is that they'll let it go. They'll continue to cover the NFL. They just won't broadcast the games. ESPN will continue to cover it in a, in a more critical fashion than they have perhaps been allowed to by covering the games, and that will be huge. The NFL Network will then uh, take on, the NFL Network will then take on the uh, broadcast, much like they have Thursday Night Football. I wouldn't be at all surprised, the only way I see Monday Night Football surviving is if they do away with Thursday Night Football, saying, you know what, those four-day weeks, uh, that's a little tough. Uh, you know, it's better to go to the 8 and the 6 instead of the 4 and the 11. And, you know, or I guess it would be 4 and 10. And let's go with that. It's going to be better for player safety. We would keep Monday Night Football that way. Otherwise, I don't see him keeping it. Because I think it's just, you know, the last, it's the, you know, do you want dessert with your meals? Nah, we've had enough. I think that's what Monday Night Football has become nowadays with Sunday night football, with Thursday night football, uh, you know, by that time, yeah, it is. Hey, would you like a dessert with your meal? No, no, it's extra money, extra calories. We've had enough. That's what Monday night football is now. So you got to get to watch it, a good personality. Manny would be that, along with McDonough. But question is, can they get him? I would want, I, I would be more interested. I think Manning would be an improvement. Not again. That's not a knock on Gruden, who I do kind of like, despite my criticisms before. I just don't think he's this icon that people tried to make him out to be before, you know, when he was being rumored all for the previous months as a potential coach. Another, there is one big name that will be joining a national broadcast, and uh, Alex Rodriguez. Fourth all-time leading home run hitter, J-Lo's boyfriend, and man who follows in the footsteps of Aaron Boone. Boone, of course, the manager of the New York Yankees, who will be stacked this year again. But uh, the he, therefore, leaves the Sunday night baseball booth, and A-Rod will be leaving Fox to join and be the color commentator uh, of Sunday Night Baseball. Of course, A-Rod replaced Aaron Boone as the third baseman of the New York Yankees, low those many years ago. So this is a, about a... Yesterday, ESPN announced the new Sunday Night Baseball booth. It will be Alex Rodriguez, Matt Varsegian, joining Jessica Mendoza uh, to form the new Sunday Night Baseball broadcast booth with Buster Olney. All right. They feel that Mendoza is a rising star in the industry. Uh, this Gershon is a fellow newcomer, but he's a familiar network, uh, familiar, excuse me, voice to the MLB network. And uh, Olney will be the sideline reporter, of course. Uh, opening day, March 29th. They'll call the Giants-Dodgers game. That's a Thursday, actually. And then a few nights later, they'll make their Sunday night debut. So A-Rod, he'll be getting... I think more exposure possibly, and I look forward to hearing what he has to say, certainly, uh, on Sunday Night F uh, Baseball. He'll be the star of the broadcast, unquestionably. I mean, you can talk about Jessica Mendoza all you want. No, A-Rod's going to be the star. I don't think there's any question about that. One final note I wanted to give on my media watch. I know we're getting a little long here, but uh, I was going through the pit, and just to right before I was ready to throw away... Uh, Tuesday's paper, I noticed a little item in the back of it that actually, and I got to plead uh, ignorance here, I didn't quite catch yesterday, but I probably should have. So this is a day-old story, I'm going to tell you. And it's that uh, Yazer Zatini was arraigned on Monday. 
Uh, Washington County courtroom charges of stealing money from the school. You've been well known, documented uh, accusation, documented accusations. Here's what he's up for. He's facing charges one count of theft of over ten thousand dollars and twenty two counts of forgery. According to investigators, Zatini allegedly misappropriated at least forty five thousand dollars from the college between September of two thousand eleven and February of last year. Did it by uh, altering documents he submitted. For, to the athletic department for reimbursement. All right, he is free on bond. You know, nothing wrong with that. The uh, point that I wanted to make is that the story in the press, back page, news section. Okay. This is just a pet peeve of mine. Because although I do realize that that's a court story, when it's a sports figure like that, and that's a story I think should be in the sports section. I've always believed that. And, you know, they put it in the back. Dare I say they hid it. I don't know if intentionally or not, or that's just the way it laid out on the paper. I could certainly see that. I'm not, you know, look, if I'm going to make accusations, I'll make accusations. I'm not going to accuse them of hiding it. You know, it's not the biggest story in the day. But it probably deserve more than back page in the news section. And it had an appeal to sports fans, and it dealt with a sports figure, and I've always felt that that should therefore be on the sports page. The people that are interested in the ETSU tennis coach being arranged, or the former ETSU tennis coach being arranged, are going to be sports fans. And so you should lay the story out in front of them. And it also shows me that the sports page is not necessarily just fun and games and frolicking in the wind and nothing matters. That there is cultural significance, and there is, on the sports page. And it may, in fact, influence the culture more than any other part, editorial, front, what have you. Well, maybe not more than the comics, but, you know. But any other part of the newspaper. And I've always felt that. And I just noticed that right there. And yet, here it is. That's a story I should have seen. But it got past me because it was in the news section. Back of the page, I'm saying, oh, that's with the weather. I mean, come on, you know. And I don't necessarily see it. What else is in the paper? I'll be letting you know that when we come back. That's Media Watch for the day. And I wanted to give that to you. There are some papers, by the way, that will put that in the sports section. I just think it is respectful to the sports writers, as a matter of fact. And it shows you that there's more than just, you know, covering ball games. A good sports writer... And in fact, I didn't once write for a sports editor who said he looked for sports writers who had news backgrounds because he knew that eventually he would have to ask them to go to courthouses to look up records. You know, that's sports in today's world. It's probably sports the way it always was. There's more than just what goes on in the field, and you should be able to handle it. Sports is a barometer of the culture. And so you should have somebody who is able to handle the barometer of the culture covering it. Like me, Marky e. Bilson, and I'll be back after this. Uh, Center, providing <laughs> people with the space for working.